I would love to answer some questions. We do have time. Yes. The article in the International, the New York Times, said that the sale was disappointing. <laughs> what did you make of that? To whom? <laughs> well, uh, the, there were people who were selling all the way at the top, but everybody else wasn't. So it, it was really a good problem. Well, it was structured that way. It's structured that way. Yeah. It's structured that way. So, you know, I'm not sure what it means by that it's disappointing the fact that there were, I mean, it's true that there, you know, there were estimates of things going for 35, 45 million dollars, 55, 65 million dollars, and then things for 500,000 and 600,000. I think it's probably, and I love Christie's, I've worked with Christie's for 30 years on various things. And as auction houses go, they're really pretty good um, in terms of their integrity. But I think uh, what has happened is we have hedge fund money coming in, uh, people in their early 40s. And the market for impressionist and post-impressionist has declined, and this is where the money's going. These, these are the artists um, that 40-somethings want to purchase that they know and that they understand and that they grew up with. They were probably children when, when all of these artists uh, you know, when Warhol was a lot and so on and so forth. So I, th I think that possibly putting in, for example, putting in Cindy Sherman, putting in 29 of her photographs, 27 of her photographs, and having it sell, it, the estimate was given at between five and seven million dollars, was I think they realized it would be an embarrassment not to put a woman in with an estimate over a million dollars, given what was going on here. But it's 27 photographs, you know? So um, I think part of it in bringing in artists that are valued at a more um, realistic, or I don't even know what to call it, I mean, it's so skewed, is maybe the last ditch efforts to try and appear, at least, as though you're not uh, Wall Street. I mean, this is, this is it's, it's Wall Street, yeah. Um. I wonder if you also don't think it's, it's important to point out, particularly for students, that these figures are not what the artists, for the most part, are making. The overwhelming majority are posthumous. The money is being made by collectors who are turning these Absolutely. works over like, like um, I mean, they're, they're collectors and students. dealers, and there are no royalties. <coughs> and the, the, yeah, because the artist gets their cut at the first at the first step, step. and that's it. So this is all secondary. Right. And there's also, there's a, there's a bill currently. Um, that may be the case. I mean, e even though it's the case, what, is, what it does is it creates a false notion, I think, for young artists that somehow or another it's big bucks to be in the arts. So even though I, I think it's an important point that you're making that this is not what the artists walk away with, um, although Jeff Koons may have because he's alive. I mean, you know, so it might be different. I don't know. Um, and well, that's that's true. But the, those were also second. They were put up on sec They were secondary marketed. But um, I I think that that what's what I'm trying to, I guess to say, and I, I think you're absolutely right, and it's it's a point very well taken, is is that the notion that art is big money really um, deflates artists, I think, and it puts a different um, notion in one's head about why, oh, well, I can go into, I mean, I do. I know young artists who are in New York who are trying to figure out how they're going to position themselves to get into a certain gallery so that they can, you know, raise the price of their art so they can blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's, it's getting on a track. There's sort of this track. And that's why I like to bring everything back and say, well, wait a minute, let's not look at the track, let's look at the train. Um, what is it that, that moves you? That's what, that's what I meant by the train. Yeah, why are you making the art? Yes, I'm wondering if you could elaborate more on what you said, um, we must create proactive, provocative new spaces. If you could elaborate a bit on that, and I'm wondering how that, um, how you approach that concept with the establishment of 
the wing at the Brooklyn Museum. Okay, yeah. I'll model you and Cliff. Well, that's why I did the Sackler Center. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, a couple of things. I, I'll elaborate more on the other. So if I don't remember to do so, please bring me back to it. Um, when I went to the Brooklyn Museum with the dinner party and proposed the Sackler Center, uh, it was very interesting because they were thinking of a gallery or a wing. And I said, no, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a center. And they said, oh, OK, fine. They had no idea what I meant. And what I meant was a living, breathing organism so that we have um, not only changing exhibitions, but we have programming that comes in that has to do with everything woman, whether it's social, political, artistic, philo philosophic, uh, musicians, I mean, you know, it's, it's all of the areas in the arts and beyond. Um, it was purposefully uh, envisioned like that by me uh, because I'm a public historian. I'm also a, a rebel. And I also realized that we have nothing like that anywhere and that this really was going to change the game. And it did. Um, it changed the game not only in Brooklyn, but it changed the game in Manhattan. But it hasn't changed it enough to really make an impact, but it's, it's the beginning. And so I, I think um, in terms of alternate approaches, that's part of what you, as young people, have to put your mind to. Why are you creating the art? How do you want your art to be seen? Where do you want it to be seen? By whom do you want it to be seen? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. And to begin to envision spaces, whether or not they're institutional or out in, you know, inside the in internal or external. So a, a, um, a, a journalist said to me before we opened, isn't it a little bit contradictory to institutionalize feminist art. And I said, well, the, it's, the idea is not to institutionalize feminist art. The idea is to feminize the institution. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> thank you very much, we have. And uh, actually, in 2017, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary. And with the blessings of the director and the chief curator and all of the curators from all of the departments from African to Indian to Asian to American to Egyptian, everything is going to be looked at through a gender lens. All of the didactics are going to be rewritten. And so it's not a question of appropriating um, material, especially uh, ancient material, as feminist. But rather, we've been trained to look at things, like Jules was trained to, to look at things, you know? And I've somehow managed to change his lens a little bit. Um, <laughs> I have to tease him. I couldn't help it. I mean, he's become a feminist. It's shocking. I wouldn't have believed it 10 years ago. But in any of oh, he's oh, no, he has not. OK, I, I, stand, I stand corrected. I stand corrected. In any event, I, I think, so the whole museum is going to be um, reorganizing its exhibitions, uh, doing new didactics, doing new labels. And of course, it is my hope um, that much of what is there may stay and remain and not be temporary for the year. And a museum has not done that. A museum in the whole world this is, it's, it will be the first time. So I, I think we're making headway. But in terms of the art market, there's no hope. I mean, this, this, is, this train left the station. It's gone. Uh, I think with institutions, yes. The Guggenheim and MoMA are, have increased their solo shows for women, but only by small percentages. And the Whitney opened is going to be opening its new doors. Uh, it's just moving downtown. And again, a small percentage by women and certainly you know, all of those museums. But they're doing more than they were doing before we existed. You know, and of course, uh, Elle was at the Pompidou, and that was a big change. That, I think, was, you know, that, that really made an impact on Paris. Whether or not that's been able to take hold, I don't know. I haven't spoken to Camille, who was a curator, but it that was quite an extraordinary show. So I don't know whether or not that sort of answer. If you're asking me how did you do it, 
uh, sit down and figure it out. And then, and, then, and then really meet with people who are of like mind. And then what I did um, with, with my idea was to think, I, I made a list of all the museums in New York. And then I made a list, it was a graph, I made a list of, of all of the areas of commitment that a museum would have to have in order for me to donate, because I gifted the dinner party, and to also give uh, capital uh, money for the, for the physical plant. And um, they ha there had to be a commitment to education, a commitment to diversity, a commitment to community, a commitment to taking risks, a co commitment, obviously, to women. Um, and, and really, I think, uh, well, the Brooklyn Museum was actually the only museum that met all my criteria. And the Guggenheim wanted it. And I was not interested. And Judy Chicago was, oh, she wanted to be in Guggenheim. And I said, it will end up in storage in three years. We, we're, we're going to create a place that is going to be a place of pilgrimage. It will be a shrine. Then there are people who said, oh, it's ghetto. So it's not a ghetto, we are a beacon. We are a beacon of light. We are, we are, there's nothing ghettoizing about it whatsoever. And what has happened, of course, is that we've begun to permeate and, and move out outside the walls. And what's been very interesting, especially I think about the programming, is that people come, uh, and we, we have programming every weekend, people are very, very hungry for the dialogues that are taking place because uh, the women's point of view isn't that often available in places. So it, it, it really is something that uh, is needed and wanted. Yes, Jules. I understand. As I've told you often, I was a feminist before there was such a thing because I grew up in the kitchen with my grandmother and my sisters. So I know that women are people, real people, in every way. My main interest in your whole discussion is whether it's about women or men is this terrible symptom of the illness of our epoch. We have a new god that's called Prophet. And profit can be the excuse for anything. It can be for having your, your labor done in another country because it would be more profit. Mm -hmm. Exploiting uh, every little law so that children of 12 can work in American farms if their parents are farmers. They can work. That um, inequality is not about gender, but it's about a lot of inequality comes from the fact that it's cheaper to have women because of the old sexist attitude about women. The thing that scares me is, and we've talked about this, I grew up in an age where artists didn't expect to make big bucks. They hoped to get shows, they hoped to be maybe making up money to live. They often did other things to support their vice of making art. And art was almost a vice. Art was something you had to do, something you felt was so important. And what was important about it is that you were making things that nobody else could have made, that you were reflecting upon existence. You were not making a product. Unfortunately, today, in a profit-driven world, many young people, whether their choice in education, their choice in subject, their choice in where they live, who they see, is based on, will it pay off? And will it pay off is the worst question that anyone can ask themselves. A return to the artist as an intellectual trying to reflect upon existence is very difficult in an age when a lot of product for a market is being made instead of an individual speaking about life. And how that's gonna change, I don't know, because Everything is for sale. Is your question how is it going to change? Pardon? Is your question how is it going to change? My question is, do you think that there is anything to be done or not? Or is there a way to, to alter this current... I don't know if there's a way to alter it globally. I mean, we all know what kind of situation we're in in terms of profit-driven everything. And we are living in a, you know, 
in the United States in a beyond the military industrial complex and so on and so forth. It's very complicated, obviously. But I think for women um, to be able to create a new model for something, um, and, and in many ways uh, for, for young women it's out of necessity because of the discrimination. Um, new models uh, are, I think, a requirement to change and, uh, and evolution and revolution back. How that is going to bleed into a culture and into our children's lives, I don't, I don't know. But we, we must. I mean, uh, uh, we have to. You know, no matter whether or not we feel like we can make a dent, you have to figure out what it is you, you're driven to do and how you want to change things and um, come up with. But a lot of it is, is coming up with a good team. You want to find your partners. You want to find an institution that agrees with you. And it, money is the last thing you need. It's, you, if, if, if you find partners and, and an institution and you're creating, your art, and you just continue in repetition, 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 there is a possibility that you can actually make a dent and make a change. But, yes? Uh, um, can I go? Yeah. Uh, one thing that um, I, I found extremely enlightening, uh, uh, all for me as a human being, and as a photographer, as an artist, as an instructor, is that at the end uh, of all the things you've said, what intrigued me the, the most and what enlightened me the most is um, something very, very odd. I have 70% of my students are females. Mm -hmm. We now now know or reconfirmed by what you said that the art market basically males. Then I wonder why this is happening. Um, something I insist on my students, and I think you're saying the same thing in different words, um, something I want to say to all my students, not only female students, but all my students, I think what happens is you go through this huge sacrifice of deciding to study something which is not common. So your parents did not invite you with great joy to go to art school. <laughs> you go to art school, you go through four years of art school, you take a little bit of time off, you go to graduate school for two then you start dealing with the, the non-bubble world of an art school, and I think what happens, which is tragic, is that we surrender. Well, and we, I think what you're saying is to the students, mm -hmm. not surrender, because I think if they don't surrender, something will happen. I think too many human beings surrender. Well, I, I think not surrendering is essential. I think fighting is essential. Um, I also think that as long as we're living in a patriarchal global society, this is the way it's going to be. So there's going to have to be, it's not, it's not just money. Yes, we're profit driven, but we are profit driven in a patriarchal uh, culture with a hierarchy and a way of behaving and a way of um, speaking, a way of communicating, a way of living, which is um, prone to this. This is the result. I mean, we're looking at results. That's not going to change. We're, we're not going to be able to change a lot of this as long as we continue to live within a patriarchy. It, it, this is what it is. This is what we're looking at. Yes, there was somebody else. Who, yes. Uh, I was going to say before that I, I, I know that you've been generous in terms of your support for the arts in areas other than big institutions like the People Museum. Um, but you've only really spoken about the bigger institutions dealing with millions and millions of dollars and granted female artists receive less in terms of the millions that they, as for which they, uh, um, money from which they, uh, that they receive from the sales of their works. But I don't think there's anybody in the room who would be unhappy with getting six million dollars rather than a hundred million dollars. Um, I'm just offering, the, uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say a little bit about uh, some of your contributions um, to enhance the profile for women artists in areas uh, less, uh, with, a, with a little bit um, um, smaller profile than places like the Brooklyn Museum, maybe giving people ideas of how they can promote females in the arts, but not 
the people who already don't need that money, in fact. Well, the reason that I brought up the Brooklyn Museum, actually, and the, and the Sackler Center is because it has been so revolutionary in what it's oh, done. Yeah, it's yeah. a completely new model, not because it's, in fact, our budget isn't all that large for considering the size of the institution that we are. Um, I mean, there are all kinds of things that people can do. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, you can spon sponsor a, a, you know, an artist to go someplace. I don't know. I mean, you have to come up with your own stuff. I don't want to sit here and talk about things I've done. It feels a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it's been fun. I think it's been effective, much of it. Um, support, I think, uh, f for people of, of my generation, I think finding out ways of uh, making changes within institutions and how you can support um, women students and women artists, if we're talking about women artists, and becoming a matron. You know, I'm finding very hard about this notion of patronage because it, you know, people use patronage and they say, well, I said, yeah, but you know, patron really is, it's men. And so you, I was invited to, <laughs> I was invited to speak, this is a good example. Here's a great example, you ask. <laughs> I received a, um, I received an email from um, the Venice Biennale, would I make a contribution, please, for the American Pavilion? Because there's a woman sculptor who's going to be in the pavilion. And it went from, you know, sort of $2,500, $25 million, I don't know, some ridiculous spread. And um, underneath or above benefactor was patron. And <laughs> as a category that you could give so much money and you would be noted as a patron. So I emailed back and I said, well, uh, I'll be happy to be a benefactor, but I won't be a patron because I won't be a patron. And if you had me, if you had matron slash patron, I would have come in because I am not a patron. And because if people don't think that, I mean, really women have to be acknowledged as matrons, I mean, of the arts. It's very, very important. And uh, 10 minutes later, uh, he, he emailed back and said, we've changed it. And we went back to... <laughs> And we went back to the website. You asked me what you could do. This is an example, okay? So he, I went back to the website, and 24 hours later, the website's changed to matron patron. So I got on the phone, and I, <laughs> I called um, Brownswell in New York, and I called Women's E News, and I called National Museum of Women in the Arts, and I all told them that the Venice Biennale has changed to matron patron, and they've changed all of theirs. And then I, so it's beginning. So, so all of the Museum of Art and Design in New York is, the board is looking at it, and they're going to change, hopefully, to matron patron. Then an invitation, and this is, again, along these lines, an invitation came in to me to speak uh, at the Jewish Museum. And a group, a young group of uh, women, I can't remember their names, but they're put, they put together um, seminars, uh, you know, for uh, museums. So I got, received an invitation because Helena Rubinstein is being featured at the Jewish Museum in Manhattan, and they're putting together a panel discussion on women and patronage. And <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's, it's focused on Helena Rubinstein, but there's also a list of 25 women patrons many of the names that you would know. So uh, in any event, I called this young woman, well, to me, she's young, and I said, you know, this, this is a lovely invitation to speak. I said, but I, and so I said, but I really can't speak to Helena Rubinstein being a patron of the arts. Helena Rubinstein was a matron of the arts. She said, oh my God, I'm so careful with my words. It never occurred to me. We're so, so she said, I'm gonna change the, 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 the title of the panel. So I said, that's terrific. She said, and then when you speak? And I said, well, hold on a minute. And I went on to the website, and the Jewish Museum has a patron category, but not a matron patron category. So I called her back, and I said, you know, it would be rude of me to sit in somebody else's house and to criticize or to even fight for a change, uh, this kind of change, if if they haven't changed it. So if the Jewish Museum is interested in changing their patron category to matron patron, then I'll be happy to come 
and, and speak. So then that had to go in front in front of the board. But those are those are the kinds of things. So I'm I'm on a very uh, I'm on a very keen roll about matron patrons. So in fact, if Satri has a patron category, I think actually didn't isn't that so, Anne? I don't know if it was to you, but there was a there was there was a when the flyer was put together, it said that I was a patron of the arts, and my assistant Rebecca wrote back and said. Under no circumstances <laughs> can you describe Elizabeth Sackler as a patron of the arts. She is a matron of the arts. So for those of you who are matrons of the art, I suggest that you own it. Because what it says to the world is that women have money, women have power, and women support the arts. It's extremely important. Yes? Could you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. With the percentage of men and women going into art school now, do you think that um, things might change in the future? Because I know that in my classes there are a lot more women than there are men. It, it's been that way for decades, actually. And I've been told by a statistician, because I was, I was always comparing it and saying, you know, there, there are 75% women in, in art schools and 25% women in galleries. And for some reason, because I'm not a statistician, if any of you are, maybe you can explain it to me. He said it wasn't an equivalent um, exam, an equivalent something or other. You know, now you can see I'm not a mathematician. I, I couldn't put something on a, a meteorite out there. But anyway, so I, I think the answer is it's not going to change. It has been that way probably for two decades, maybe more. Uh, and the question is why, why the flip happens. And the flip happens because the men own the galleries, men buy the art, men have and control the money. When in fact, actually, there are more and more women, at least in America, I don't know if it's true in Europe, who are, have their own money, who are responsible for their own money, and who purchase with their own money. So part of the other change that we can see is women making determinations about what it is that they're going to buy. And um, yeah, you know, there's there's one other really interesting thing. I was, uh, do, how many of you know who Linda Nochlin is? Pretty well. All right. So Linda, Linda, uh, Linda's a really fantastic uh, art historian, and she's she was one of the first um, uh, critics and art historians. She's not really a critic, but she, one of the first art historians to write about feminist art. So she and I were talking, and I, because I was talking, she wrote, um, why have there no, been no great women artists? She wrote that in 1974. And it was an article, actually, that was not a statement, but an answer to a question, which was posed to her. Why have there been, not, you know, been no great women artists? And so she was writing her article. And in her article, she says, there have been no great women artists because historically women couldn't study art, women couldn't study life's drawing, women couldn't paint unless they were the, fortunate to be the daughters of artists. You know, And she was sort of going on historically about what's gone on in the last 150 years about why there have been no. And I said to her, I said, first of all, Linda, we need to write another article because it's always cited. I even saw it actually in an, there was an Italian, it was either French or Italian, I can't remember what, it was Italian, it was when I was here, Mary, it, that it cited it. I said, you know, Linda, you've got to write another article with just as sexy a title, Be because people cite it as if it's an exclamation point. I said, but I want to go back to why, why it is that you agreed that there are no great women artists and said that the reason there aren't as many or so many great women artists as there are men, Michelangelo, blah, 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 is because they haven't had access to. I said, has it occurred to you that the way in which we look at art and determine whether or not art is great is coming from a gender lens? And if we start looking at art with a different lens, we might find that some of the balloon dogs aren't so great. Oh. <laughs> but of course, Germaine Greer yeah. in the obstacle race really does expand it a little bit more and explains where some of the problems came from and perhaps ways of addressing it. The problems as as Linda was talking about, but what I but 
but what I, I don't know whether, I haven't read that, so I don't know whether or not Jermaine Greer um, really talked about the way in which our gender lens informs us to a certain extent. So that's a good book to read. Yes? I, um, I, have, I feel that what you're saying is we need to redefine the humanity that we want to live in. And so, uh, I mean, can you all hear? No. Okay, no. sorry. It seems that you're she, she says I'm saying that we need to redefine the humanity we want to live in. I, I want to repeat that because she's right. Um, I understand that. I'm an artist myself, and I teach at Polimola, and uh, sometimes I really, in my art, I face uh, the fear how people don't want it to be changed, and sometimes I'm really fine with it, but I wonder how do you respond to people's fear of change? Oh, I don't care what people think. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have a second question, which is sometimes I see that we've been so quite brainwashed about the male glaze, but it's, even as a woman artist, I see that I create some kind of image that are still male glaze orientated, and yeah. it's so difficult to detach, to really be truly in touch with our femininity, and I think it's a conversation that we need to bring also male to be in touch with their feminine side. And I, that, I think that's absolutely true. It goes back to how insidious the patriarchy is. We don't even realize it, and and we we just we don't see things see we don't see how skewed some of what we see is. Although you're recognizing it now, we were just discussing it earlier. So there is a difference. So the the, the point of this is again goes to your question of what can we do, is to begin to come become sensitive about not only the way in which we perceive things, but about the way in which we express our perceptions, to become sensitive to that. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's it. This was, oh, one more, yes. You know, figure out how to phrase this exactly, because everything that we're talking about here applies to less to a very tiny part of the population on this planet. No, I don't, well, I don't agree with that. What, what I think that? everything we're talking about here applies to everybody on this no, planet. I, 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 agree. I agree, but what, I, what I'm trying to get at is that the I mean, Western society, which, and we're, that's North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, whatever, I mean, we're, we're, let, we're about not quite a billion people on a planet of seven billion and growing, and we are the only part of the world where since the end of World War II, women have begun to have some kind of economic independence, um, a general acknowledgement that we are equal and half, and so everything that you're talking about, everything right. that we have grown up with, and this is a blink of an eye in history of humanity. Mm -hmm. It could be wiped out in a second. Mm -hmm. There are billions of men over there who would love to destroy <laughs> this all. Um, and, um, and it was wonderful because a cousin of mine who actually originally didn't want to become part of the Sackler family curator at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art because he said, why would I put my money into anything feminist? began to um, actually do some research. And uh, a year later, uh, my cousin called and said, I'd, I'd really like to make a contribution, but I'd really like for you, uh, if I could speak to the curator, who is this Catherine Morris, our Sackler family curator at the Sackler Center, um, about doing an exhibition on Islam and the women of Islam and um, the horrors that they are undergoing. So I think the answer is, of course, it's all a blink, but it all is a blink anyway. So we all just have to do what we can do and hope that what we do makes a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.